Uh, firstly, I just wanted to say an enormous thank you to everybody in the room uh, for making this exhibition happen uh, during a really, really weird, weird time. I really appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you. Um, for those of you who don't know my work, I make digital video installations and prints featuring complex landscapes that have been manipulated using CGI animation and sound. Through my work produced over the last 20 years, I've been asking viewers to consider what the future might look like if we continue down our current trajectory of planetary pillaging and consumption and uh, why we've allowed ourselves to arrive at such a moment of global environmental crisis. So I'm going to walk you through the exhibition um, as though you were just arriving through the front doors. So as viewers enter the exhibition, you will first encounter Pillars of Dawn, which is a series of prints and a large scale video, which imagines near desert landscapes in which environmental conditions have crystallized the terrain. Centered within each composition is a singular tree holding its form despite the considerable weight of its mineralized crust. What caused this potential future landscape isn't apparent. Is it the result of an unknown disaster or a fallout uh, for ever increasing amounts of carbon in our atmosphere? Uh, there's always multiple ways to read my work deliberately. For centuries, the tree has stood as a symbol for myriad human concerns. It has symbolized life, fertility, peace, strength, and victory. In the face of climate change, Pillars of Dawn undercuts this traditional symbolism and seeks to re-signify trees as symbols of trauma. Roughly speaking, there is one crystal in each of the landscapes for every species alive today. We live in a time when many scientists believe humans have caused the Earth's sixth mass extinction event, which we are now well uh, into. It's been referred to as a biological annihilation, which uh, studies concluded several years ago revealed the loss of billions of populations of animals in recent decades. The World Wildlife Fund has reported that we have lost half of the world's wildlife on this planet in my lifetime. To use Alistair Robinson's words, my work asks us what we truly value. In each of the scenarios we encounter, we see a beautiful, empty, crystallized world. It's almost as though all life forms have been transformed into pure carbon. That is, into the most concentrated forms of pure carbon in the natural world, diamonds. The majesty and infinite wealth of the earth is revealed, although no humans appear present to appreciate it. If Pillars of Dawn is a view of a potential distant future, that's where we're starting in a distant future. From there, we enter Embers and the Giants, which is a large scale video installation set in the near future, presenting an endangered old growth forest during last light, articulated by thousands of floating embers of light. Initial impressions may be that we are witness to a rare and exceptionally beautiful display of fireflies, or perhaps the embers from a forest fire out of, flame, out of frame. The longer viewers look, the more evident it becomes that we're not witnessing a natural spectacle. We're witnessing human intervention through thousands of tiny drones mimicking a natural spectacle, suggesting a time when we, we will need to amplify the spectacle of nature in order to convince the public of its worth. Ancient trees on Vancouver Island, some of which which are up to 2,000 years old, are the rare remnants of industrial logging. Part of the coastal Douglas fir ecosystem, it's one of the most endangered in Canada, with most of the, uh, the planet's old growth logged worldwide, already logged. It's now home to now extremely rare giant trees, a vital part of the ecosystems which sustain wildlife, store vast amounts of atmospheric, atmospheric carbon, clean our waters and are an important part of many First Nations cultures. Yet the loss of these irreplaceable forests continues at a pace roughly three times faster than tropical rainforests are disappearing worldwide. That's a staggering fact. 34 football fields of old growth is logged every single day on Vancouver Island alone. 
Like these giant trees with quickly dwindling number, numbers globally, fireflies are also threatened with extinction. Embers and the Giants calls, uh, questions are calls for preservation at a time when large scale environmental breakdown is by climate change, caused by climate change. It is not a case of if, but when. The idea for the work was inspired by two news articles accessed that I accessed and read in 2016 uh, about threatened old growth forests, one in Pachidat territory on Vancouver Island and the other in northern Mexico, which after the discovery of a natural spectacle, fireflies and uh, giant trees, uh, in the case of, uh, of Vancouver Island, successful cases of preservation for preservation were argued. Both areas are now extremely popular tourist destinations. I find that quite remarkable. In light of the terrifying fallout of continued large-scale biodiversity loss worldwide, when are vital ecosystems worthy of preservation? Do we need the cute insects, the pretty insects, the amazing trees? Um, how are we able to continue to justify their loss at such a critical juncture? Under what metrics is that justification measured? And in the future, how will those metrics be viewed? And most importantly, what are the futures? What will our futures look like given current predictions? Following Embers and the Giants, viewers come to Halo, which was produced in the fall of 2021. Halo 1, 2, and 3 are sequels to Camp. Uh, a video which presents a cliche of outdoor life, which I filmed in 1998. It was a really early video work of mine, uh, one of the very first, actually. So it's a, it's a sequel to this. Um, in camp, the full moon, uh, I'm filming a full moon on a summer evening, and it is distorted by the heat rising from a crackling campfire out of shot. On the fire, popcorn bursts, and with each burst, the moon dances. 23 years after producing camp, the promise of what summer brings has changed, as you all well know. Uh, the Halo trilogy presents two full moons, one partially red, another fully red, both distorted by heat rising from something burning and crackling out of view. Uh, the third video presents a solar, red solar eclipse uh, known as the Ring of Fire. Embers float around and smoke swirls. Past, present, and future, the Halo trilogy references the significant feedback loop we are now in after decades of warnings. Campfires are now banned in the summer in British Columbia, where I live and you live. Um, with severe extended droughts being the new normal, the risk of wildfire is extreme. Compounding the threat, 2021 produced record temperatures reaching a staggering 49.6 degrees Celsius, smashing the previous record by 4.6 degrees making international headlines. Uh, it was the third worst fire season on record, all three of which were recorded within the last five years. Simultaneously, the UN declared that it is code red for humanity as a result of climate change. Lastly, <laughs> with a bit of hope, <laughs> viewers arrive uh, at the present day with Journey to the After, which was just completed it's a three channel work. I don't have a lot of words for this yet because I'm literally, it's just completed and I find it hard to often uh, find, find my words immediately, but I'm doing my best for you. It's a three channel work which presents a panoramic view of a large expanse of water during first or last light, depending on what happens next. That reflects the vibrant colors that fill the sky. Dozens of floating tear gas canisters, the aftermath of, of a protest emerge on a spectacular surface while butterflies flutter and rest on the canisters before carrying on their way. Journey to the After is an homage to endeavors past, present, and future to positively alter our current path. The work is grounded in the power of protest as fertile ground from which to change our futures. Uh, such endeavors are needed now more than ever. That's what I have for you. And I'll just, I'll, I'll finish by saying that that is where hope lives for me.
No. So, so the three works, um, the first moon on the left is the partially red moon. And that has, that window has passed. That's, that was the threat that we've been told about for decades in my mind. We're now in the middle channel, which is the present. So we're now actually experiencing that feedback loop that we've been warned about. Um, and it looks like we're going to have a very similar summer, uh, according to uh, some warnings. So, and then of course, this the future being the eclipse, the ring of fire, this kind of inescapable um, thing that we can't turn around at that point. So that's where the past, present and future comes into that work. So the answer to that changes drastically depending on which work we're talking about. I always start with an idea uh, in my head and, um, and then I try to figure out how I'm going to make that thing. Um, over the years, I guess it's, yeah, it's been a long time now since I've been using 3D or advanced software, but um, the capabilities within each program vary drastically or have up until this point. Um, and so in the past, I have, I have worked with almost every bit of software you can imagine. Uh, what happens is I come up with the idea that I try to figure out how I'm going to make it and which software pro program is going to be able to handle making it. So if I use Pillars of Dawn as an example, um, the, that, those landscapes and that tree and the bushes uh, in it are covered in actual object crystals in 3D um, that I sculpted and then um, add some randomizing parameters to literally blanket that landscape in millions of crystals. That information is so computationally difficult for most programs that they would just like throw the, you know, most programs were like, nah, I'm out and quit the second I tried to do it. But I had heard of a little program um, called Clarice, a uh, French company made it, and they were claiming to be able to handle insane amounts of geometry. So I got in touch with them and this, <laughs> this is what I do. <laughs> okay. If if let, let's test that, let's really test that. Will you give me your software and I'll really, uh, I'll really put it to work. And um, I can do that in a way that film often doesn't because film, you know, it's three to five second shots and, and they can kind of trick your eye a lot faster than, than I can. I, these are sustained shots that you can watch and scrutinize over, over an extended period of time. So I, it actually acts as this um, kind of spotlight for what programs can do if they can do it. Um, in this case, Clarice did the job really, really well. It handled all that geometry brilliantly, and it was the only bit of software that could have handled it at the time. Um, now I think actually Blender could probably do it as well, but um, I'm going to test that soon. But uh, yeah, it, it, it goes from idea to how am I going to do it? Sometimes I'll enter a program, try to make it work. Um, Chero knows this. I started another series in the summer, last summer, and I came to a brick wall and this was in Cinema 40 and I came to a brick wall with water. The water just looked horrendous. And um, I had to just stop that. Uh, it just wasn't wasn't good enough for me. So this happens a lot where I'll hit a brick wall and then I have to enter another program and see what it can do. And so I switched to Blender because Blender had this reputation of being really great with water. And um, it was actually through that process of working through that problem that that the idea for Journey to the After came about. It was largely about water, and then I started imagining what this could be, and and um, you know, also coming that also came about because I was asking myself about what hope looked like. Um, so it's it's that kind of um, finding my way through a, through a set of problems that an idea presents, and um, finding yeah, finding a way to actually facilitate the idea. Um, 
Embers and the Giants was made largely in After Effects. After Effects is used in almost everything that I make um, as a compositing tool. So usually I'll make the 3D elements in a 3D program, render those out, bring them into After Effects, do the compositing, render out, bring that into Premiere Pro, mix my audio, re-render it out, compress, send it to you. So the question is about how how I operate as a as a solo artist uh, working with with three D, which is a pretty intense thing to be working in as a solo artist on a single machine <laughs> with no budget usually and uh, no render farm at my disposal. That is not what three D usually looks like when people are working in it. Usually, there's large teams of people. Um, that specialize in different areas that that bring a production together um, to a high standard. Um, so yeah, so I, I'm one person working on one machine. Um, usually in in a 3D um, uh, studio, they'll uh, yeah work as a team, get the get the project to a point where it'll render and either they have their own render farm, which is usually a room with computers all hooked up to one another and they share the, the data crunching effectively for um, rendering out what that video is ultimately going to look like. I think 3D has become a little bit throwaway and people think you can click a couple of buttons and you've got a video it's it's just not that's it's that's not realistic at all um it's a really pretty uh intensive process and it's computationally very very intensive hence the need for render farms so to give you an example i have worked on a project before where it was going to take six months to render it and this was after several months of me making it and getting it to a point where I thought, this is great, I can render it now. And then when I went to test it, it was going to take six months. I didn't have six months to just walk away from my computer and let it do its thing. So I shelved the project and moved on. I just was like, all right, well, I'm not making that one then, I guess, and, and moved on. So I've been struggling with this, with this render process for quite a long time. The, the, the way that people get around not having their own render farm if they're a solo artist like me is that they'll often they'll send their files to a render farm elsewhere, uh, usually in China. And again, it's a room full of computers or possibly even a warehouse full of computers all hooked up to one another. And they'll do that data crunching uh, a lot faster and you pay them an arm and a leg and then they send it back to you in however fast you need it. Um, I don't do that. Uh, I don't know how environmental that is. Um, a, B, um, there's, it, I, I can't see, you can't really see, uh, properly the animation until it's rendered. And so if, even if I did that, I would have to render it and then look at the minor mistakes or or um, just look at it visually afterwards and then scrutinize over it. Chero knows I'm doing this like currently <laughs> because so I'm like, I might replace those files again. I'm really sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, because, because I can't really see it and really just live with it until it's moving in, in, in 3D, it's it's you can't really see it moving very well um, yet until you render it out, and so that's when you see the mistakes or you see issues that you would change, um, and then you have to re-render it. And so with Journey to the After, I've already it's already re-rendered twice. Uh, it's going to go through another iteration soon. <laughs> um, just tiny, tiny little things that I see, and I, and I, I just, I, I know they'll bug me if I don't go back and fix them. So I'll, I'll just, I'll go ahead and have to render it again. So I don't know if that answers your question, not very succinctly, but uh, partly don't 
work with render farms because of um, questions around how environmental that is, but also that it's uh, a process that what I would have to bounce back and forth numerous times to do it. Um, so I just work with my one machine. So the question um, Chero asks is uh, to speak about um, coming to this as a with a painting background and why why I chose to uh, start working with Weaving Image. Um, yeah, I I started as a painter, and uh, in school I was making um, colored field paintings. <laughs> Before that, I was I. Before I started school, I was I my goal was to try to draw things as realistically as possible. And then when I entered school, I realized I didn't know understand color and how color worked at all, and how I could work with color and emotion without using representational subject matter in the paintings. And so I spent many years as an abstract painter in school, and then I. When I was graduating, I uh, destroyed all my paintings because, because I wasn't asking the question of why I was making artwork at all. <laughs> you know, like what, what, what did I have to add what, to this larger conversation of, of art and contemporary art? And from there, um, I, I started leading um, all of my, all of my work with, through ideas first. Uh, and so if I had an idea to make a sculpture, I made a sculpture at that point. If I, it was a photograph, a photograph, I made a photograph. If it was a painting, I would still make a painting and slowly video took over. And I think what I discovered with video and moving image was that I could do with it what I could not do with any other medium. I could have an impact um, and uh, create a, an environment that I just could not replicate with any other other medium. I, th I mean, I think that the, so. The question is um, uh, with each work. Did I make a conscious decision of of how much I was referencing science fiction or horror within within the work? And I think that um, uh, that's you know it's a great question. I, I'm not sure that I ever really ask myself that specific question when I'm making work. It's more about what I'm trying to do with the work, and if it has to be. Um, if it has to lean more towards uh, science fiction than it does to, to get the right uh, feeling and, and maybe um, kind of balance of aspects of fun and joy mixed with the horror that you mentioned or the, the you know, the terrifying under underlining um, ideas explored in the work. It's a, a balancing act. It's always a balancing act of, between that and um, and and the beautiful, and and allowing there to be a payoff to to look at something that actually might have a horrific potential reading to it. I always say that there's a potential uh, because I believe that we can turn this around. Um, I think. I mean, it, it, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. Um, so the question is, were the fireflies uh, appearing to go behind or through things? And was I playing with that? I wasn't intending to go through, but what I definitely put them behind or into, if that makes sense. So there, there are many layers in that landscape that um, through compositing, the the fireflies were disappearing into different uh, layers. So, uh, you know, a foreground, a middle ground, a, a background behind the tree, in front of the tree, on the branch, off the branch, or behind the branch. So, I was definitely playing with a, an imagined three D space because it was not. It was taken from. It was it was filmed on a IMAX camera actually, 
that was an IMAX commission. So it was obviously a, 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 an actual threatened and endangered um, old growth forest uh, here on the island. And, uh, and then how one would insert uh, 3D effects into that would be to create a number of, of masks where the bugs appear to go behind or on or so I, I was I was definitely playing with that, but light is a strange thing. So light, you know, behind a blade of grass might appear like it's going through it as opposed to, you know. Um, so that might be tricking your eye a little bit there. Yeah, it was just it was really those movements were really powerful and I just I don't know. It doesn't have to be explained, but I thought if it was super intentional on your part, I'd love to hear about it. But obviously it achieved the effect that you intended. So I did, but I'm going to pretend that if it was powerful for you, that was totally intended. So the question is, how often do I, am I able to have the videos shown to scale? Um, that I'm happy with, uh, you know, most of the time galleries don't have the height that you do. So actually I think Kamloops is a really special place. Um, for mo most of the time I have to try to imagine something being nine feet tall at its maximum. A lot of times I can't go that high, but if Embers and the Giants, for instance, was shown at nine feet tall, that tree would be pretty tiny. And I don't think it would have that impact that, you know, that impact on the viewer with that piece in particular, I had dreamed of creating a one-to-one -one scale in a, in a gallery, but those trees are so large that if I cropped it, it would just be <laughs> the base of the tree and, and we lose so much, um, so much of the video. Um, so it's it's always a challenge it it's a it's a challenge there are works that have been shown too small and i've agreed to do it because of the limitation of the space and then with some regret attached to it i try to be amenable so i'm like i don't know okay we'll give it a go and then it's actually the public that come and see it small and and then they're the ones that are disappointed and express that you know it shouldn't have been shown like that I actually learned early on not to make too many compromises there, even though I still try to be amenable um, and work with spaces. It's I won't go too small because then the, the impact of the work is just not there and, and people feel a little bit heartbroken. If they've seen it, particularly if they've seen the work elsewhere and then they see it highly compromised, oh, that's, that's pretty, it doesn't look good on anybody basically. So it's tough. Yeah. So for reference, um, when we did the math, we would have needed a wall twice that size. That's about 30 feet. So it would have to be 60 feet to actually so show the scale of that tree, oh, wow. which is yeah. about 12 feet across. <laughs> Still, yeah, yeah, it might it might have been larger uh, as an IMAX, but you're sitting you're you're sitting in a weird place with the eye. You know, it might have been actually. It might have felt more to scale in IMAX, but there's not too many places that can replicate an IMAX situation. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yay.